So uh, this is uh, fuzzing for developers. Um, I've written uh, C++ since uh, 2004. Doesn't matter for this talk because we're gonna see like two lines of C++ today. Um, I'm on Twitter uh, and here's my webpage with a link to the talks, which is good if you find it interesting because the links are clickable to tutorials and videos, etc. So what's fuzzing? Uh, Wikipedia says that uh, fuzzing is a software testing technique where you provide invalid, unexpected or random data to your program. So it's something like this, <laughs> times a million. <coughs> uh, so when I say input to the program, um, it can be like input files, but it can also be if you're doing hardware I.O. You can fuzz the, like emulate what comes from the hardware. You can fuss uh, interleaving of threads because that's unspecified which order threading happens. And you can fuss a lot of things. Um, so why should you bother to fuss? Uh, the thing is that you can find corner cases. And they find stuff you couldn't think of. So when you're writing unit tests, etc., uh, you can only write things that you know that you know. You can't uh, write unit tests for stuff you didn't know that you didn't know. So fuzzing uh, bring, uh, brings this to you. So this is really good. It's also automatic. So once you set it up, you can just use it. So uh, once you pass the initial threshold, there's no problem. Um, <clears throat> for instance, you can uh, fire it up when you leave uh, for the weekend, Friday afternoon, and then let it fuzz over the weekend and then come back Monday and see what happened. And someone else might fuss your code. Might be your users. So I'm speaking about the monkeys with the keyboard. So uh, not that the users are there, but uh, someone might actually fuss your program and uh, do it because they're evil and want to do some exports. So uh, Google has a lot of experience in fuzzing. They run something called the uh, cluster fuzz. It's something like uh, 10,000 CPU cores, which do fuzzing 24-7. They have found uh, 16,000 bugs in Chrome, more than 11,000 bugs in uh, other open source projects. So there's something called OSS fuzz. So I think these numbers are quite impressive. Um, <coughs> Curl is a well-known Swedish uh, project. Um, in 2018, six out of 12 security issues were found through fuzzing. So fuzzing really works. It does. So today's talk, I'll give, try to give you an overview of fuzzing, what the basic idea is uh, and what pitfalls there are. I'll show you a demonstration and I'll give you some tips and tricks so my goal is that you should be able to fuss your own code or someone else's for that matter. But uh, so you can, um, yeah, find bugs yourself. So what do we want? We want to find input that causes crashes. Uh, we want to trigger certs. We want uh, to expose undefined behavior. You have to freeze memory leaks, all the usual stuff we don't like. We want to expose those during the fussing phase. Uh, so they don't, we can fix the problems so they don't happen afterwards. So the big question is, how do we find these inputs? So here's a, a basic attempt. We have a random source here on the left. Uh, we pick n bytes of randomness. We feed it to the program, see if it crashes. If it crashes, yeah, we're good. That's what we wanted. Um, if it doesn't crash, we'll just repeat it. And this is called generational fuzzing because we generate the input. We generate it from scratch. This works. Uh, some programs can't handle this, uh, but it's horribly inefficient because picking an interesting input but at random, which is like 16 bytes long, that's a very small chance. And uh, besides that, we don't know how to choose n. If you have a fixed size input, maybe you should pick some other end so your program crashes. Or if you have a fixed size input, maybe you should just use that all the time. How do you know? So if we improve on this, 
uh, we might take advantage that we know the input format. Um, so there's a good example, C Smith. Uh, it's a program co-authored by uh, Jan Reger, Mr. Undefined Behavior. Uh, it generates random C programs. Uh, they look like garbage and you f uh, feed them to the compiler and see if it crashes. So this is great uh, because this will reap much, uh, reach much deeper into the program. So this is nice, but the bad thing with this is that the fussing can never be better than the tool. So uh, for instance, if you would do this with a PDF parser, uh, there's a huge difference between a basic PDF parser, we can only parse the most basic specification of PDF, compared to the full-blown Acro Adobe Acrobat with embedded JavaScript and code signing and whatnot. Um, and you can, if you use the same input on those two, that's, that's like two different things. So it's important that these don't adapt to the targets. That's a key observation. So let's add another improvement. So we will have this uh, green circle here, with, which is called corpus. <coughs> It's a set of interesting inputs. So if you have a PDF parser, it would be a bunch of PDF files. If it's a, a JPEG parser, it would be a, a set of J, JPEG files. Then we add the yellow circle here, which corrupts the input. You can flip a byte, insert a random byte, cut off some, splice two inputs, do whatever random permutation needed. And then we feed that to the program. This is called mutational fuzzing because we mutate existing inputs. And this is much better uh, because if we have a valid file to start with, uh, we reach very deep into the program and it's much easier to trigger those weird behaviors. And you still don't need any source. Uh, uh, you can just run this on your binary. There's a nice tool called Radamsa, which helps you with the yellow part. So if you have a set of files, you can just run Radamsa on them and uh, it will just generate a lot of garbage and you can just uh, feed them to your program until it crashes. This has found lots of bugs and this is how people have found errors in like uh, Internet Explorer and uh, Adobe Acrobat, etc. So this works. But we are developers, so we have access to the source. So the first thing we will do is to improve the crash probability um, we can add a lot of asserts to the program. So the idea is that we increase the likelihood that we detect when we have illegal input or bad program states. Maybe we can use uh, contracts from C++20 when they are uh, finished. We can compile with hardening flags to detect that the stack is corrupt, etc. And we can use the address sanitizers and memory sanitizers and the friends of those. And we can also use this trick. We can swap out the memory allocator. And I'm not talking about the allocator, which is the template parameter for your strings and standard library uh, containers. I'm speaking about the replacement for malloc. So there's something on Mac that's called uh, guard malloc. And uh, there's something else called electric fence. Uh, we also have lib dislocator. All these allocate memory uh, apart from other allocations with guard pages in between. So that means if you are overrunning your buffer, uh, you will go uh, on into a memory page that's not yours. So the hardware will signal that you're, uh, um, well, you have a seg fault. Uh, so it's much easier to de detect uh, memory errors. Lib dislocator, it also brings uh, uh, canaries, so you can detect when you overrun or underrun. Um, and it can also fill the memory you allocate with garbage. So your program is more likely to crash if it has um, uninitialized input, which is undefined behavior, by the way. So, so far we have learned that uh, now we know how to let the execution reach far into your program. And we have made it more likely to crash. So this is good. So now we're going to bring the biggest improvement, feedback. So feedback is the single most 
important thing in fussing, if you ask me. It uh, makes the fussing orders of magnitude more efficient. And this is because uh, the crash or no crash signal, it's way too blunt. It, um, we need more fine grade information. So we will start monitoring the execution path. And uh, when we do that, we will feed back uh, inputs that are interesting. Once we generate an interesting input, we will add it to the corpus. And that means the corpus will grow over time with input. And it looks like this. The green one is the new addition. So while we run the program, uh, we have this monitor checking, uh, does this input take a new path we have never seen before through the program? And if the answer is yes, that means that this input is significant. And we add it with this feedback loop. Now there's a cycle here. So that means the corpus will be, be filled with interesting stuff. And once you have the interesting stuff in the corpus, it will start generating new input from that input and will continue. And as you'll see in the demonstration later, this will co go on for generations. So uh, this is very efficient. So how do you monitor the program? Well, uh, early debuggers, uh, early fuzzers, they used the debugger, like, like debuggers monitor programs, that's slow. You can do hardware support if you have a recent Intel CPU. You can run in a virtual machine, so a special uh, virtual machine which is uh, instrumented. And you can use compiler instrumentation. So when you compile the programs, you insert extra uh, statements that will do the tracing for you. So uh, if you take all we learned so far, these are two fuzzers which are a state of the art as of today. Uh, it's the American Fuzzy Lop, uh, AFL. You've probably heard of that if you heard of fuzzing before. And the other one is libfuzzer, which is included in the <coughs> LLVM project. Both use feedback and they use compiler instrumentation, so you need the source. AFL also has a binary mode if you want to run it through uh, Kimu. So it can actually do fuzzing on binaries too. So this is my view of the current state. So beware, it's just my opinion. So uh, AFL is uh, very stable. Um, and so it's not that developing anymore. It's, it works, but it's not, nothing is happening anymore. Uh, Libfuzzer is also stable, but it's still improving. So over time, I think I expect Libfuzzer to be even better. Uh, regarding performance, AFL is slow. It depends on what your definition of slow is. Um, but if you count the number of executions per second, AFL is slow compared to libfuzzer. Both of these are extremely well written in terms of performance. So I don't think you can do anything in AFL to make it faster than it is. Um, so regarding user interface, AFL has a great user interface. You'll see it soon. I just love it. It's the, like an 80s style text interface. <laughs> yeah, it's very good. Uh, especially if you're a beginner, which might surprise you. Uh, Libfuzzer has just uh, uh, text on the terminal throwing out. And uh, well, it's good, but it's not as good as AFL. So let's switch to demo. So is Arvid here? Ah, there. Uh, Arvid has written a library called Be the Code. So it does something with libtorrent files, I don't know. I don't know really, <laughs> maybe you can explain later. Uh, it parses the tree structure from a serialized format. So uh, I looked at this project and I found a unit test. So it takes a buffer and uh, it calls this function be the code. And that's it, this is, that's how you use this library. So that looks pretty easy to start fussing. Uh, so, I should say, our task now is find what should be written here in order for this to have interesting behavior. That's our goal. 
So this is on the Debian. It works on Ubuntu as well. This is how you install the tools. It's just supported upstream, so no effort needed. We need to write an entry point. So I should say this is for AFL. Um, so here you see that you define the main function. We take the first argument on the command line uh, and we treat it as a file name. We just open it, read it into a buffer and uh, we call it into BD code. There's a missing assert uh, and the namespace, etc. But this is slideware. You'll see it working in a minute. So uh, then you compile the uh, entry point. And the only difference to a normal compile is that it says AFL dash in front. Uh, you have to make supply an initial corpus. AFL doesn't like you if you don't have an initial corpus. So we'll just make an empty file, make it start from scratch. If you know what to put into your initial corpus, please do it because it means your fussing will be much more efficient. So if you can, use it, but it works anyway. We know to create the output directory, so our results end up somewhere. And then we just run it. So we call AFL fuss, where the the corpus is, where the output goes, and then how to invoke the program. The at at is uh, that's the placeholder for the file. Yeah, now it's time for me to embarrass myself with the keyboard. So, try to make this full screen. And, uh, so, we will first uh, compile. So you can see uh, we get some status information from AFL, and this looks good. If it doesn't say anything about instrumented locations, it's something is wrong. And then we will run it, and maybe this won't work. We'll see. Yeah. So AFL is very user friendly. It will tell you what you did wrong. So uh, I'm just skipping over this check. So if you do this for real, you just uh, switch out the scheduler. So it uh, runs your CPU on full speed. So uh, um, if you do this for real, do as they say, not as I do now. <coughs> and it's uh, starting. And that's it. It's working. So th this is the fantastic user interface. Oh, if you take a look here, total paths, this is how many unique input paths it has found so far. So you can see it's, it's finding stuff right now. And if you look at the levels, level 3 means that this input is based on another input that's based on another input that's based on the initial stuff. So we are like, uh, now we're four generations ahead. So this shows the power of uh, using feedback. And we can also have a look here. There's the execution per second. And this, this uh, is a very fast tar target. Uh, it's 4,000 executions per second. So hat off to uh, Arvid. Um, yeah, and that's it. And then this will go on. Um, so the good thing with this user interface is that uh, green means good, red means bad. So if something happens, we uh, find a crash. This will be red. And uh, if you did something wrong when you prepared your program, uh, it will most likely be red up here. It says, uh, your program is weird, I can't find anything. And it will be red. So this is very good for beginners. Plus, it has all these nerdy features where you can see what it does currently and uh, see how it goes. So, I recommend this. Um, yep. So, this is just my backup slide in case uh, the demonstration hasn't worked. So, if you want to uh, uh, understand what all the numbers are on that screen, you can go to this link and it will have a uh, describe them in detail. So now we'll have a look at libfuzzer, which is part of LLVM. 
It's in process. AFL start, uh, forked off the process for each try. So it did 5,000 forks per second to uh, do the testing. LLVM just runs your program in a loop instead. It works very well with sanitizers, so that's good. It doesn't have a cool uh, user interface. This is how you use it. There's a predefined function signature which you have to match. So you just get data from the program um, and you just pass it to your library function. <coughs> And you compile it just as usual, but with a, a caveat that you have to use clang and you have to use dash f sanitize equals fuzzer. And that's it. That's the only difference. And you run it like this. Uh, libfuzzer will link in a main for you, so you don't define your main. And then you just run. So let's go here. Whoops. Um, so you can see the compilation, nothing weird. And you can see it's running now. It will uh, output a line when something interesting happens. So these reduce lines, uh, that's when it finds the test case. Uh, which is, gives the same path through your program, but it's smaller. And small input is good because the number of permutations uh, grows very fast with the uh, input size. So it's good that you have small input. And you can also see uh, is, this is a coverage metric, uh, how many features are seen. Those are not directly comparable to AFL. You can see the execution speed. So this is 500,000 executions per second. So it's a hundred times faster than AFL. But this is a very fast target. It's good to know. Yeah, and then you just uh, wait. And this is the bad thing with this. Uh, how long should you wait? You don't get that nice color feedback as with AFL. And uh, if you see this for the first time, I think this is more difficult to grasp what happens. Like, does it work? Or we don't know. But this works. This is how it should look like when you run a target. So if you want to decode the output, uh, you can uh, read the documentation here. So about the reproducer. Uh, so this is a good thing to do. Uh, you'd write the minimal program to replay one of these inputs. So if you find something, you want to be exposed it and you want to to be able to debug it and run it in Valgrind. There are some caveat, caveats to this. So uh, uh, I'll see if we can switch again to the reproducer. Yeah. So the first thing we'll be doing is that instead of running the, uh, the normal uh, fuzzer, we will use it with a sanitizer. So now we have uh, address sanitizer, and that, that's what it found something. Did you see? I'll do it again. So, I'll, I'll clean everything. Okay, everything is clean. And I'll compile and then run the fuzzer and see if you notice when it starts. So it's compiling now, then it ran. So it took like two test cases for it to find an error. So now we have a bug. So you see there's a file called crash. That's the, that's the input, looks like this. So now we're gonna use our reproducer. So this is, um, <coughs> oh, can I make this bigger? No, oh, that's too big. Yeah. So we just uh, take files given as file names and we feed it into, uh, slurp it into a buffer and feed it into BD code. So uh, this is really handy because we can just compile it as normal. Whoops. So we compile the reproducer. 
and then we run the reproducer like this. So this looks fine, right? Uh, we had the crashing input and the reproducer ran without crashing. So why is that? Well, we should turn on the sanitizer. And we should pick the right file, reproducer um, sanitizer. So now we have a reproducing test case which we can work with and uh, put in running. We can run it in Wellgrind and do whatever we like. So it's not connected to fussing anymore. So this is really good if you want to send it to the developers or whatever. Um, yeah, that's it. So I'll show you a ca uh, caveat. So one thing that has happened to me a lot of times is that I can't reproduce what the fusser finds. And that's super annoying because you know there's an error and you can't find it. So what often has happened then is that the memory is... Um, so we should modify it. This returns a std vector. So if we do like this, we, uh, we reserve some data just so... Uh, the backing array is bigger, then we won't be outside memory. So if I save this, uh, whoops, and then uh, compile it. Oh, I had some other default targets. Um, so if I try to reproduce now, you see it doesn't reproduce, it doesn't crash. So when you're stuck in this situation and you can't reproduce an error, think about uh, trying to be, to be try to be more evil to the program. Allocate memory as tight as you can. Don't use a vector and that uh, push back because it might be larger than you want. Don't uh, say be performance uh, minded and uh, like keep things allocated together. Instead, allocate everything separately. Be as evil as you can. Don't think about performance. Think about maximizing memory, the that we, probability that we detect memory errors. Yeah, so that's it. And by the way, uh, this bug was fixed uh, like a year ago or so. So Arvid had already fixed it. It was just he hadn't pushed it to this repo. So this is no problem. Oops. Yeah, so about uh, speed, um, you should expect something like a thousand executions a second. If it's smaller than that, uh, you should start worrying. Don't use exceptions if you can. You know, exceptions are fast, except when they are thrown, then they are slow. Uh, when you're fussing, 99.999% of your input is going to be garbage and cause uh, uh, exceptions to be thrown. So you're going to throw exceptions all the time. So if you have a choice, don't use exceptions. Uh, this is a favorite of mine, the fast plus slow idea. So uh, if you have a binary um, which has all these hardening, all these um, sanitizers, etc., it's slower. Or if you use this allocator, it will be really good at detecting errors, but it will be slow. On the other hand, you can make a really fast binary without uh, the instrumentation. So my idea is that you have a fast plus slow. So first you have a fast fuzzer that doesn't detect errors. It will just maximize coverage. And you saw the lib fuzzer, it has like a factor of 100 faster. You run that for a while and you can even run that multi-core. So you run that until you have a good coverage. Then you'll have an excellent corpus to start with. Then you switch out the binary to one with all the sanitizers enabled, all the asserts enabled, everything you can, and start fussing with that one. And it will be slow, but it will be good at detecting stuff. So if you have this fast plus slow idea, you can be overall, you can be very efficient and uh, in a short time. Uh, use several fussers. 
The fosters are different, so they detect different kinds of errors. So don't you just use one, use several. Um, actually, uh, AFL and uh, LibFaster work well together, so uh, it's a good start to use those two. Don't mix some related things. Uh, say if you have an image parser that can parse either JPEGs or PNGs, don't decide which one you're gonna, uh, which one you're gonna uh, interpret the buffer as at the runtime. Instead, make a separate fostering target for each of them. Otherwise, when you mix up test cases with them to get new interesting input, you'll mix unrelated data. So the uh, fussing algorithm will be much less efficient. So run, run one tar write one target for one thing. So this will really speed up things. So here's, oh, I forgot to add the links for this one. Yeah. Uh, so here are some uh, resources. Foxglove, this is a link to a blog post from Foxglove Security. They uh, write how you use AFL over time. If you have a corpus, what do you do with it uh, when you're done? How do you maintain it over time? <coughs> uh, the fussingproject.org that's run by a German guy called Hanno Beck. Uh, he has lots of interesting info. He has found a lot of errors in a lot of projects. Uh, and this is a talk from NDC Tech Town. can provide it later in the YouTube link. That was really good, getting started with AFL. And Kostya Serebrani, uh, the guy from uh, Google, who is uh, one of the maintainers of uh, LibFuzzer at LLVM. He, every year he holds a talk about fuzzing at CPPCon. So if you haven't seen one of those, just pick one at random and watch it. So uh, thank you. I will uh, answer any questions right now or uh, come talk to me. Thank you. Uh, Arvid, let's start with you. Yeah, yeah. just as you have another corpus. Yeah. But if you want to run GDB on it, you don't want the faster mechanics. You just want GDB or run it through well-grind. So you don't want to interfere, interfere with the with faster, right? But if you pass in a, a test case, you yeah. can just run that one test case and exit, so you can run that on your runner. Ah, okay. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not directly. I think you can use AFL to put those. Uh, that I think you have to write a wrapper for it. Yeah. Okay. So you have to, you have to like, have one corpus and you split it, or do you, can you have multiple corpuses? Uh, no, you just have one. So then you have to do something special. So it's difficult because uh, what should go the command line? <laughs> So what you can do is you can like split, say the first 10 bytes is what I pick for my uh, command line and the next one is what I'm pick for, picking for the network. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, I saw only one. <laughs> what, what was the bug yeah, in your example? Uh, it was, uh, I think it was uh, the referencing the end iterator. Arvid should know. Yeah, so I don't think it was that serious a bug. So uh, not that easy to exploit. Yeah. Yeah, the, your example is a, a library with one function. If you have a library that has several functions that are semantically connected, like say, say you want to pass something like the vector, how do you do that? Because Depending on what functions you have called, other functions are not legal to call. Yeah, um, I actually tried to fuss your library. <laughs> <laughs> the, the uh, uh, what was it? The, the priority queue. Uh, so you, what you can do is you can loop over the input, and then you can um, 
uh, depending on the state, you do different things. So you take one byte at a time. If it's uh, zero, you do one thing. If it's a one, you do one thing. So you can list all the API calls. So if the uh, library is good, it will throw over something if you misuse it. So you might have to check that, oh, okay, I won't do this because then it will just error out immediately. So you will have to write some kind of adapter that provides random like link between the random input and what's actually happening. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned something about uh, fuzzing multi-threading. Uh, how would you fuzz the different scheduling of uh, threads? Uh, uh, I don't know. I just know that uh, people have done that. Yeah? Yeah, so in that case where you actually call exceptions from the input, can you sort of feedback that information so you can avoid those paths? So you can get a renewed process. Um, but if it's scary, something I can do, then the library will tell me that it's not legal, so I won't try. I don't think that's really doable, right? No, I have to think about that one. So it's, it's trying to maximize uh, coverage. So I think it has a hard problem avoiding something. It's, it's trying to attract something. No, oh no, I have to think about that one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess my question is quite similar to Jörn's question, but you mentioned um, for instance, uh, JPEG or PNG parser. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't just give it random data. You have to understand what you give it. Uh, and then you are still, you know, in your own bubble. So you will only randomize. Then you're almost back in uh, your, your first asser assertion that you're only randomizing stuff that you know. No. Actually, it uh, is uh, really scary what AFL can do in that case. Uh, so there's an example where they start with the uh, null byte, that's the corpus, initial corpus. After three days of fuzzing, it has made up a valid JPEG input from nothing. Uh, so uh, I think I should show you the... Maybe you can... Uh, if I can find the links to uh, AFL, yeah, here it is. So uh, to press F11. So I think this is really amazing. So ah, I thought it was on the front page. Oh, I can't find it immediately, but this. Uh, I, I, I think I saw it. So if you go down, you know, better. Oh, I'm doing something wrong. Uh, yeah, I can't see it, but it sounds right. Is it up or down? It's right there. there. Yeah, right yeah. Oh, yeah, this is uh, like three years ago when I clicked this link, my X server crashed. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I clicked, yeah. Uh, so the, I think those these aren't uh, generated from scratch. Um, so this is just horrible. So I'm, I, this is pretty bad doing of me because this is likely to crash my web browser. <laughs> but, uh, um, we'll see how, how well Firefox has. Possibly. Yeah, it was a few years ago. So yeah, so I think making up JPEGs of uh, thin air is the. Yeah, here it is. It can be a bug in, in uh, multiple layers. So for me, the X server crashed. So, so here's a really nice description and uh, how it works. So you can do lots of interesting stuff with the fuzzing. You don't need to just find crashes. Um, this is like, I want to generate an input that comes to reaches this point in the program. So you take that point and take, uh, make an abort there or an assert, uh, uh, assert false. So once the program reaches there, it will terminate and say it has crashed. And that's where you want it to go. Now you have input. How do I reach this line in the code? And that's how you do it. And that's, uh, it's scary, actually. So if you run AFL in your own programs, it's, <laughs> it's a scary experience. Okay, it's one, it's 
one of the things with enough monkeys you write Shakespeare, right? It's the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. like these are elite monkeys with yeah, brains. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Monkeys. Yeah. 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 So any more question or is, yeah? Is it that uh, you can only uh, get one error at a time and then the program terminates or? Ah, yeah, that's a good question. So that's the difference between uh, AFL and Limfasser. So if you AFL, it will just uh, collect them in some kind of trophy list. So see if I can. Uh, oh, I must have. Uh, must find the link. So yeah. So I'll try to show you with the mouse. Uh, it says there are total crashes. Uh, so if you find it starts crashing, <laughs> this will just uh, increase and will turn red. And we'll just save it and go on running. Uh, so that's very good if you have a lot of uh, bugs. And uh, that's easily happen if you have a like shaky library. And it's like, yeah, but I don't care about that, those bugs because it will just interrupt me all the time. So that's good. So if you have a well-behaved library, which doesn't crash very often, only when you find something real, um, Libfaster might be better because they uh, exit at the first error. Yeah, so maybe we should break for dinner. Make the break now. Thank, yeah, thank you.